Let's do this. In case you're here for the first time, my name is Bini Matsunaga and I'm a fully trained and certified kimono teacher and stylist. I have to emphasize that this video is See it as a sew along instead of a tutorial. I will give you all the measurements and stuff that I have used to make this hakama, but I'm making this for the very first time. And for me, a tutorial is something in, where I show you how to do it, and I am in some way already kind of used to it, which is not happening with this hakama going on right now because I have done it for the first time. <laughs> Before I started sewing, it really took me a while to get information of how to make a hakama because usual kimono sewing books you get in Japanese bookstores, they do not contain a hakama. And for this video, I have been collecting lots of books. In the end, I used five for reference. Two of them are historical, they're over 100 years old. One of them is from the 1950s. That was, by the way, the most helpful. And two of them are modern. And one of the modern is actually not even in my possession. My um, kimono sewing teacher sent me pictures of it. And that was the second most help helpful one. For this hakama, I settled on a fabric that was sleeping in my stash for a few years now because it's it's the best and most beautiful fabric you could ever think of and i think if i would be a fabric i would be that fabric because that is so me unfortunately that fabric was a little bit too thin for a hakama um, at least the hakama i have been working with so far and the hakama i do own um, they're more a sturdy stiffer fabric because you really want to have i don't know even why but i think it adds to the look. So I decided to flatline my hakama with a different fabric that was also cotton fabric but way thinner. No, you usually don't line a hakama and I already got messages on Instagram why I did. Simply the reason because I wanted to have the fabric quite stiff. I do have to admit that wasn't the easiest. I would not recommend you to do it for your first hakama. I shouldn't have done it. But in the end, the outcome is extremely cute as it looks right now. I kind of worked with it, but definitely having only one layer there will definitely make it nicer. Okay, so let's get started. A hakama consists of two panels, one front panel and one back panel. The front panel is wider than the back panel. Most sewing books I have used as reference showed how to piece a panel together out of a not so wide fabric. So the seams then will be hidden under the pleats. But luckily I had enough fabric to cut out the panels in one piece from my fashion fabric and interfacing. And I know that now a lot of you want to know what fabric size you need to make a hakama. And this doesn't really add to the narrative of this video, but I wanted to share with you how hard it actually was to figure that out. Because when you already have a kimono sewing book at home and you try to work with it, I think you might have noticed that kimono sewing books never contain all the information you need, or at least all the formulas or the math you need to make a kimono. And I have quite a collection of different kimono sewing books for my oldest one is 120 years old. And I can tell you that continues throughout 120 years. They never give you all the information you need. So with this hakama, um, I had three sewing books that contained the hakama 
one modern and two historical. And I checked on what measurements I need for the Hakama and they told me quite well how to get like different places of the Hakama, but they didn't tell me what width they told me the length, but it didn't tell me what width I need for the Hakama. That width that is eventually gonna be pleated up and be folded into the size you need on the top. And I had the assumption because I had like seven widths to work with in the end. It was quite a variety. And um, the smallest was about 130 centimeter and the biggest was 180 centimeter, which is 50 centimeter difference, which is half a meter difference. That is huge. So I had the assumption that probably because of the pleats, it doesn't really matter. So I called my sewing teacher and she basically said at light night, yes, that's true. You shouldn't worry too much about the width there because um, it's just like origami, she said. <laughs> you basically just fold it into the size you need. And when you have more fabric, it means those pleats become deeper. And when you have less fabric, they're less deep. That's what she said. But she also said, I'm gonna look it up tomorrow. And she sent me pictures of a sewing book that finally had the formula I needed to figure out like the original width and length of the fabric and I'm so happy she did because I'm quite satisfied right now. And I'm going to share my new one knowledge with you. Feel free to take a screenshot and use this for your own hakama. The hakama size are the measurements your hakama should have when it's finished. It's a lot but simple math to do and I recommend to take time before you start this project and calculate and write down all your sizes. This will help you when you for example want to make this hakama over a longer interval of time. Let's say like two weeks, not only three days. So it's easier to revisit this project. The fabric size is the fabric you need for the front and back panels. Then I flatlined my fabric. Oh, and did I mention that you should not do this? <laughs> what I'm using to mark out the markings is in Japanese called kote. And in English, I would refer to this as a Japanese sewing iron because this iron here is only used for sewing. This one here gets put into something that looks like a bucket and there is the heat source inside which heats up these kote. This is actually the kote of this whole thing. And yeah, use the sharp edge on top here to mark out your markings and it's awesome because you can mark out several layers of fabric several right now this goes to through three uh, four layers of fabric but it goes up to six layers i think the thickest i have ever done were like six layers of fabric and you have markings on every layer it's amazing and this is how you can very easily achieve the symmetrical style of a kimono. This is how it's usually done. Let me put this away because it's really hot and it's actually super um, dangerous. <laughs> what households in Japan used in history when they didn't have a kote at home was this tool. I have no idea how this is called, by the way. I just know this tool. And you can use this sharp edge here to press in your markings. You will need a little more strength than with your kote and it also doesn't have like the heat factor, but still um, this works quite well. And I can only recommend you to find something sharp with a sharp edge and then just mark out 
everything on the fabric. You can, of course, also use tailor's chalk or any other thing of pencil or pen that is out there for sewing. You will have to do then both sides, which means you will have to do double work. And right now, because of this time, I don't have a lot of time to finish off this project because I really want to have this video up in time. That is why I'm using my content this time. And because I'm asked very often, how long do those markings of a cote stay or can you iron them out? They stay forever and no, you cannot iron them out. So when you really do a mistake like I do, you have to prepare something that helps you to smooth out the crease. And I have this one here. Um, it's called smoother in Japanese. This is for ironing clothing and you just uh, spray it on and it smooths out any creases. This one is really amazing. I can only recommend it when you live in Japan. Have this at home for um, ironing your clothing. By the way, again, my husband introduced me to this. This is my husband's thing. So don't tell him that I'm actually using his stuff again. <laughs> This is the illustration of how I marked out the hakama. My illustrator skills are unfortunately not that high that all the proportions are right, but I think you get the idea. The pink 30 cm marking is only provisional. You use this to get the placement of your second pleat. So keep in mind that you don't need this marking anymore. When you're quite new on my channel, you might wonder what sewing supplies for kimono sewing are out there. I've already done a video about that and I will link that video down below and in the top right corner. The markings on the front are the following. Again, the pink 30 centimeter only help you to get the second plate. The female hakama, as we know today, had its final shape in the end of the 19th century, when the hakama was introduced as school uniforms for girls. Because in school, they had to sit on chairs, and as you can tell, sitting on a chair in a kimono for a long time might cause the two front panels to slide open and reveal your underwear. At least, that is what history books are trying to tell us. But personally, I always sit on chairs and never had such problems. And especially in history, several wrapped skirts were worn under the kimono. So even when your top layer slides apart, you're still fine. I think introducing hakama as school uniforms was just another way to get Japanese people used to the idea of wearing skirts, hence Western clothing. For the sasahida, this decorative part on front and back of the hakama, I drew lines with a pencil onto the fabric like in this illustration. And then I pressed along those lines to transfer those markings onto the other side too. Be aware that back and front sasahida have different sizes.
Then I pinned the side seams together and sewed them down. After that, I hand sewed the bottom hem. I'm often asked if hakama have pockets or not, and I've done some research on that, how it's done in history, and the answer is no, never. But there was a brief time in Meiji and Taisho era where it was tried to invent some new kind of wafuku, Japanese clothing, that should work with the new living standards by adopting western clothing elements into kimono. The outcome was called a kaidyofuku, and those had actually hakama or something that you could call a hakama with pockets. But kairyofuku never became really popular and disappeared soon. I want to show you how to do the sasahida. Um, these two probably tucks, I would say, on the top of the hakama. And they're made in a very specific way. This is also not the only way to do this, so no worries. If you do it another way, that's fine. So we're gonna start on the back of the fabric. For this video, I use the side with the two lines I have drawn out because it's then easier to show what I'm doing. And what I do first is I fold this layer here in to the first line. And I'm gonna um, press this down. And then I'm gonna fold this down to the next line here. And yes, it's a little bit of a struggle because this line here is not a straight line. You can see, we can somehow make it work. And you press this down too. And then I turn this here. And then I fold this open. And you can see that I struggle a little down here, do everything just to make this nice and smooth. It's gonna be fine. When you fold this back, you wanna show this part here about five millimeter from the inner edge. So this is how much you have to fold this back here. And I'm gonna press this in place once more because now we have to do the hard part which is we'll have to fold this up and you have to make a seam right next to this fold here. Don't do it on the fold here. You want to have this right next to the fold. You can use a pencil and just draw out the line right next to the fold so you get, won't get confused where you should sew along. And then we have thread and needle. And I'm gonna show you how to sew this down. So I'm gonna do quick and easy stitches. So I'm gonna start with a small stitch on the bottom, on the top. And then I leave one centimeter between and I make a second small stitch through all the layers of fabric. And again, one centimeter apart and a small stitch. And you can do this with unshin too, of course, if you want to. Keep in mind that you could do the stitching here also by machine. That's absolutely fine when you want to do this by machine. When you buy um, hakama today, they're usually about $30, they're really not expensive. This step here is done by machine. So you have a machi machine stitching here on the side which is, it's on the inside, so you don't see it. So it's nothing wrong with it. So you could stitch this down by machine. And now 
again we are folding this back and you want to have this here five millimeter over the inside edge but it does look good. And now you have to blind stitch these two edges together. The top of the side seams are then secured with a kanuki tome. You do two to three horizontal stitches and then you sew vertically around those stitches so the thread wraps around it. This is also done at kimono sleeve seams or on the bottom of a miyatsuguchi. So I hope I'm not too much out of frame and you can see me and it's also actually <laughs> focusing on me. I wanted to give you some feedback or let's let's say it's a piece of advice when you're planning to make this. Yesterday I made the sasahita and it actually took me a whole day because I remade them twice and there are in general not so hard to make but it's really hard to show them perfect and neat and I think they're quite good now but it's still I probably will remake them. Um, I think I have problems with showing them really neatly and nicely because I have actually a back lining and have two pieces of fabric and I think that makes it just unnecessary <laughs> bulky and let's just not talk about them. Don't look at them. <laughs> when you really want to make this I do recommend to first make the sasahida and then you sew the side seams and I hadn't even considered that because all sewing books I have referred to tell me to first make the side seam and then do the sasahida but the hakama I do have at home that I got really cheaply on the internet and is definitely mass produced and also not sewn in Japan I think that one actually has the sasahida first made and then the side seam and when you think about it, everything that is mass produced is actually tried to be done in a very, very easy way, which tells me that's probably the easier way. <laughs> and I should have done it like that and it would be way less struggle and it probably would look way better. So do the sasahita first or do the side seam first and then live with your imperfection, but then you have the hakama super traditionally made. I'm honestly wondering if I would have done this in sewing school if my sewing teacher would have told me to do the sasahida first or the side seam first. That is what I'm really wondering and I'm gonna ask her. So I'm probably, you will hear more about it in the voiceover. Yesterday night I already um, put pins in my markings that we had made earlier because those cotton markings, they stay in but sometimes they're really hard to find. <laughs> So I have one here in the center and one pin at every marking on back and front. Um, this is my front panel. This right now is the back panel because my sewing books, all sewing books say do the back first. So we're gonna pleat now the back first and you're gonna follow along this. Um, a lot of sewing books give you like these kind of um, illustrations in the end and they're so hard to understand which you should pleat first and then my teacher sent me this and this book actually shows me exactly from one to two three four how I should fold the pleats when it's amazing I'm gonna set this information of course on screen because it will help you so much more so stop the screen and take a screenshot this will save your life I have done a little test yesterday. It was so easy to get those plates in. Just because of this, of course, because this helps a bunch. Okay, so let's get started.
I started to fold down the pleats on the back panel in this order. Again, not perfect proportions in this illustration, but you should get the idea. Once I've done all the plates, I base them in place. Don't forget to measure those plates. On the back panel, they are 3.8 cm on the top and 7.5 on the bottom. After basting top, bottom and center of the pleats, turn the hakama and start to pleat the front panel. Here is the illustration that will help you to get the order of the pleats right. All sewing instructions I have referred to, they show you several ways of the order to make a hakama. Some start with the pleats after cutting out the pieces, which makes it definitely easier to press the pleats in. But most instructions said sew side seam and sasahida before pleating. So I did it this way, but which order you do is basically up to you. Before basting the pleats in place, I check and adjust the width one last time. Front pleats are 3 cm on the top and on the bottom they are 5.7 cm. Then I pinned and sewed on the ties. I totally forgot to film this step. I had prepared the ties the night before and I made them out of two fabrics. Important side note, when you want to use two fabrics too, only do it for the tie on the back, not on the front. This is one of the errors I want to revisit and fix in the future. I left the center with the pleats of the hakama open when I sewed down the other side of the ties. After turning the ties inside out, I blind stitched the ties onto the center of the hakama. And it was finally time to put on the hakama for some reveal shots. I have linked the video of how to put on a hakama down below and in the top right corner.
And after I had my hakama finally on, I noticed that I still had these terrible sneaker socks on. <laughs> and I changed immediately into proper tabi. And after enjoying our garden, are you actually wondering how I pressed in the pleats? Of course, for the real shots, I have taken out the basting. Although you can tell in the review shots that the pleats still haven't settled really nicely. And I also have very weird creases on very weird places. And a lot of you might wonder how to get that out and how to get those pleats nicely in. What I do recommend you to do is to baste back in the basting or keep, just keep the basting in. And that's what I'm gonna do right now. And make sure to baste the hakama at three points. You have to baste the bottom about five centimeter to ten centimeter from the top and also in the center on both sides. Okay, and now you fold the hakama as you would usually fold it to store it nicely. By the way, for folding a hakama, please refer to my video how to fold a hakama. <laughs> and I'm gonna bring this into my closet and put it under a pile of kimono for one to two weeks and that is how oh, it's gonna be ironed really nicely or let's say it's gonna be pressed really nicely without me struggling at the ironing board and before the comments go crazy down there yes i will make a hakama one day in the future it is planned Yes, I will make a video that will show you the differences of men's and women's hakama. But you will also have to wait until I get to it because I have so many projects on my list that I want to do before I ever make a men's hakama. So make sure to subscribe and don't miss that video. And I promise the other videos I'm working on right now they're going to be awesome. <laughs> so when you want to learn more about kimono from a professional kimono teacher, make sure to subscribe to this channel. If you like this video, leave me a thumb up or even a comment and don't forget to share. That actually helps me out the most. And I talk to you in my next video. Bye.